don't have to wait until next weekend or Christmas Day to begin talking about um, Christmas. And what I wanted to do is kind of start to build a little bit of tradition for us here at South Point. And so I want to take today, I want to start out today's message by reading the, the Christmas story. And, and you can find that in Luke chapters 1 and 2. And I'm going to start in Luke chapter 2 for us. But I, I want to read uh, the story of the coming of, uh, of the king. So we're going to turn, I'm going to read from the Bible here just so I can flow a bit better. But they've got the, the, the verses on the screen for you here. So we start here in, in Luke chapter 2. If you've never read the Christmas story, I mean, this is a great place to start. But it says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. That is, uh, this was actually the first registration from Quirinus, who was governor of Syria, and all went out to be registered, each in his own town. And Joseph, Joseph who would be the father of Christ, from Galilee... From the town of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, so they had to go to certain places depending on the lineage that they came from. And he was to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for Mary to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because... There was no place for them in the inn. And in that same region, there were shepherds, and they were out in a field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. I just want to pause on that there. Could you imagine being shepherds out in a field in the dark and this happening? And when I read this, I I think that God has a very unique and interesting relationship with shepherds. You know, when David was anointed, David was a shepherd. Jesus comes as the shepherd. We are referenced as his sheep. So actually, I see that it's only fitting that God chooses the shepherds to be the first to reveal the coming of the king. And so it goes on here and says in that, I'll back up in that same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel says to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And then in verse 11, For unto you is born on this day the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among those with whom he is well pleased. And that's all of us. You know, this story that we look at here, all of this effort went into bringing Jesus into the world. All of this effort went into announcing the presence of a king. It it wasn't a a gentle announcement. It was an angelic host of angels. And and they acted like a backup choir to these shepherds. You know, God could have revealed this to anybody in the world, but he chose to reveal it to these shepherds. The elaborateness of getting uh, Joseph and Mary to the right place, to bringing them to a town where they had to be for a census, but there was no room at the end. And so because there wasn't room in the end, Jesus was in the manger there is where he was placed when he was born. All of this happened just to announce the coming of the king. And so today, the message that I have for us, I've got titled, and they'll put this on the screen for you here, go Go back for us, Michelle, to our our title slide here. The message today is titled, The King Has Come and He Has Brought Gifts. Now, I want to talk with you a little bit about gifts. In my family, the way that Christmas worked is gifts were a huge, huge deal. And for all of you out there that say that Jesus is the biggest deal in your family, you either don't have kids or you're lying. (laughs) All right? Now, Jesus matters to me and our family, and he always has, but gifts were a big deal. And in my family, gifts played a really important role. Uh, In fact, 
I, I would go to bed on Christmas Eve. I would struggle to go to bed because I would know that on Christmas morning, I would get up and I would walk down the stairs and I would come and I would find the tree there. And my, and my parents didn't put any gifts out until Christmas Eve. When we went to bed, well, Santa did it. Uh, but Santa would put all the gifts out. And so on Christmas morning, when we would wake up, I would wake up around four o'clock. Yeah, four in the morning. My eyes would just bing, pop open in the bed. And I, I maybe went to sleep at like 1.30 that night, just laying in bed, unable to even deal with the expectation of what's coming the next day. And in, in my family, my parents, I mean, we went big for Christmas. And, and I will say that, that we grew up in, in, in an incredibly privileged household. I mean, I don't want to ignore that at all. We grew up with so many blessings. My parents worked so hard for it. Uh, my parents wanted us to have, you know, a better life growing up than they had growing up. My dad grew up extremely, extremely poor, so he worked very hard for us, and, and we just had these amazing Christmases. And so at four o'clock, my eyes would open, and I would, I would wait until the clock said 6 a.m., because I knew at 6 a.m., my parents may not be pleased, but they wouldn't murder me. And so at 6 a.m., I would go and I would wake up my brother, who's five years younger than me. And we would run down the stairs and, and stand in awe looking at the tree. And then slowly my mom would come in, and we wouldn't touch the gifts yet. And then later my dad would come in. And then once everyone was there, we would begin the process of opening gifts as a family. Now, for a child, gifts are just th this sense of wonder. It's, it's just what, what's going to be there. We turned in a list, you know, because you, you don't want your parents to get you the wrong thing. And so we had a list. There's always a wonder of what's actually going to be there. And that wonder, over time, kind of gets lost because as parents, Christmas is very different than it is for kids. The idea of gifts is very different than it is for us as we were children. And some of us carry a lot of anxiety. We carry a lot of um, disappointment or maybe even jadedness because we're not able to give the Christmas that we would want to give for our kids. We're not able to provide the presents that we would have hoped to be able to provide. Yeah, I know for our family, there have been a couple Christmases where the money just wasn't there. And so we made sure Leafa had something under the tree. But then outside of that, we just didn't, we didn't do Christmas. We just didn't do gifts. And, and that happens to so many of us. And so I, I just thought, maybe there's some of us that are walking around Canal Walk or the V&A Waterfront or Access Park, and you're coming to the realization that, man, I, I'm not going to be able to provide what I would like to provide. And this should not matter that much to us, but the truth is, is that it does. It does impact us. So I thought it would be really fitting to think about and to talk about gifts today. Because I know next week and throughout this week, it's a mad rush. You know, I, I know dads, men, you know, how many of you guys have got your wife's gift covered? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some smart ones raise your hand. The rest of you are, you know, in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of that happening this week. But for those of us that maybe are struggling, maybe we feel a bit, uh, maybe jaded is the wrong word, but we're like, we wish that we could do something more. What I have for you today is an extremely encouraging message. That's why when I talk about the king has come and he has brought gifts, this should be for all of us today something that is very, very encouraging. And the reason it's encouraging, because if the king has come, which is what Christmas is all about, if the king has come, then that means that the father has come because Jesus is our heavenly father. And if the father has come and he is bringing great gifts, then that means that we get to assume the position of child. And so I, as a child of God, get to look at my gifts from Jesus with wonder and with awe like I would gifts under the tree on Christmas morning. Guess what? As a child, I never worried about the cost of a gift. That was for my daddy to worry about. And as a child of God, I don't have to worry about the cost of my gift of salvation. I don't have to worry about the cost of the gifts that Jesus brings because my daddy, the father, the king, he covered that cost for me. And so if you find yourself looking for some encouragement here in this season, if you want to pick yourself up, then that's what today is for. The king has come and he has brought great gifts. And as the father 
covers all the details and everything. We as children just get to walk through the rest of this season with delight, with awe and wonder, with being just blessed and amazed. And what's great about the gifts that Jesus brings is it doesn't matter if you're poor. It doesn't matter where you come from. None of it matters. The greatness of those gifts is equal. It's equally magnificent for all of us. Now, back to gifts. When we would open up gifts, there was a rule in our house, especially if we were at grandparents' houses. We were not allowed to open a gift without first looking for, at least looking for, the card. We had to know, we had to just pause for a moment and see who the gift was from. And even in our house, it was important for us to know which gifts were from Santa. And listen, if Santa offends you, you can send an email to linton.dames at southpointchurch.co.za, okay? But, you know, there were gifts under our tree that were labeled Santa. It was important to know what Santa brought. It was important to know, especially like what my dad would, would give us. That was always really significant for us. But when we went to friends' houses, we were just taught, hey, boy, don't you dare rip that paper until you have looked for a card or a name or something. And then us, we would get really good at kind of quickly opening the card to see if hopefully money would fall out, you know. (laughs) You know, pocket that, you know. And so in the same way that Jesus is bringing us these great gifts, I also want to take a second, and before we look at the great gifts that Jesus is bringing, I want to open the card and first take a look at who the giver is. And so the, the giver, that this is Jesus. Let, let me show you in Luke 2. Let me show you who the giver is. Because we need to be reminded of this. The, the giver in Luke, in Luke 2, 12 is, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby. See, the baby is the giver of our gift. Jesus came as a baby. He came uh, as man. And, and some of us need to remember that because Jesus did not stay this heavenly figure on a throne before God or with God. Jesus came down as man. He lived the life that we live. So when Jesus gives you gifts, he's given you gifts because he's been in your shoes. He knows your perspective. He knows what it's like to be us. And he does that from a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. You know, I wonder what it would be like for, I can't imagine what it would be like for Mary to put her child in a manger. We, we gave birth to both our kids at Vincent Pilate. I say we because I was very much involved in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we had a journey. And so uh, one of them we, we had at Vincent, you know, you don't get to book a room, but if you get there, you know, early enough or it's not busy, then they give you a private room. And for Benjamin, we didn't have that. We had to share a room. There was an amazing family in there as well. I mean, again, we, Casey and I and our family, we come just from so much privilege. So this is not a complaint at all. But just because I'm super introverted, I didn't even want Casey in that room with another person. So I was like, I, I want to get you out of here. I can't imagine what... Mary and Joseph felt like putting their baby in the manger. You know, what, what, the, what that was like for them. But that's how our king came. I wonder what the pigs and the goats thought when they thought our food should be in there. But instead, there's this little wiggly thing, you know, that's making noises, that's cooing. You know, that's looking for mom, that's being fed. That's who the king is. We need to remember that. See, there's tenderness in the presence of Jesus. And sometimes we forget that the child that we're celebrating is supernatural and miraculous, and he can have an impact on our lives that is also supernatural and miraculous. So the king has come, and we remember that today because the king, as a baby, even as a baby, was supernatural and miraculous. And the gifts that he wants to give us today can have a supernatural and miraculous impact on our lives. And so now that we've opened the card and we know who the gifts are coming from, then we can talk about what these gifts are. And, and I, Jesus brought three gifts. And, and as Luke lays the story out for us, there are three specific gifts that came with Jesus. And these are for you today. You can accept these or not, but they're here for you today. The first gift is that the king comes with an abundance of joy. See, joy is an emotion, and and, and joy is something that is for 
all of us, and it comes with an abundance of joy. Many of us are not living in a state of abundant joy right now. Now, I think that we could look at our world and our current events and say, how could we live with joy? But you know what? Current events are always going to try and take our joy. Let's look at where we find this here in Luke's story. So this is where this abundance of joy comes from. In verse 10, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I will bring you good news of great joy, great, abundant joy, that will be for all the people. See, what this was, this was even the foretelling that the gospel message, the love of Jesus, would not just be for the Jewish people, but it would also be for the Gentiles. It's for all people. So can you accept the abundant joy that God has for you? Because it is for you, just like it is for anyone else. See, as that little baby came and laid in a manger and brought these gifts for us, the purpose The king's purpose in doing this, the king's purpose for us is abundant joy. That's what God wants to bring us. And and, and just to even further illustrate this, it reminds me of a verse in John. It's it's in John 10, 10. And it it says this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. You know what? I'm tired of being stolen from. I'm tired of being killed. I'm tired of being destroyed. I'm tired of it physically, emotionally, spiritually, spiritually. I, I, I know that, that you're also tired of it. I, at the end of the year, we all feel a little bit tired. And what's been happening to you is the thief has been coming. And it's been coming in the sense of busyness. And it's been stealing a little bit of your joy. You know, the thief came and, and the, the Feroza, which has become like a character in my sermon illustrations, the Feroza broke down on Thursday. I pulled into the quick spar. At, uh, at Pineland Square, it broke down. I just put the key under the floor mat and left it. <laughs> Called, left the door unlocked and called the mechanic to pick it up. But the, the, the thief wants to just pick away and take our joy. But like John 10.10 10 says, is that I came, Jesus, the baby in the manger, he brought the gift that we may have, and that is eternal life, and we may have it abundantly. There is abundant joy for us. If you're not feeling abundant joy then I, you know, I can't give you a magic formula for just how to accept that into your life because it's hard. It means you've got to overcome some thoughts and some feelings, but it is there for you. And it's between you and God as to how you accept that joy, but I promise you, it is there. His purpose is to fill you with abundant joy. Just start by asking for that. The, the second gift and even the third, they kind of come together is, that, is this, the, the king's presence, or the king comes to give peace and to make us pleasing to God. He comes to give peace and to make us pleasing to God. Let's look at where that is in Luke. Look at how this peace and pleasing to God is announced to us. In verse 13, this goes back to the multitude of heavenly angels. See, I think that this is significant here because the announcement of peace and the announcement of us being made pleasing to God doesn't just come from one still small voice. It comes from a host of angels, a multitude of angels, which that tells me that the peace that's being promised, the pleasingness to God that's being told is a gift for me to take, is something so great and so mighty that God used a a choir of angels to announce it to us. It wasn't given through Paul. It wasn't given through a disciple. It wasn't given through, through those means. It was announced by angels. An angelic choir told you and told us about the peace that would come. And this is what they say in verse 14. And it says, glory to God. This is the angels singing. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace among those with whom he is well pleased. See, God, when, when the baby comes, when the king comes, something significant happened. It changed the world. And when that king came, he brought heaven on earth. See, with the presence of that baby, the announcement from the angels, the shepherds being told about it, heaven came to earth. As that manger was filled with the baby... Heaven came to earth. And when heaven came to earth, we get an opportunity to see and realize and claim that these gifts that Jesus brought, he brought to us. 
And when heaven came to earth, Jesus brought with him the kingdom of God. He didn't just come by himself with his pockets empty. He showed up. He had his wallet. He had his belt on. He had, you know, he had his glasses. He knew where his keys were. Never lost his phone. He came totally, totally prepared. You know, I lose my phone on a Sunday morning approximately 17 times. I actually had the band stop playing during warm-up so that I could ping my phone and find it. But the king doesn't, he doesn't come like that. He doesn't come with a rattled brain. He doesn't come scattered. He comes to bring heaven on earth and he comes to bring his kingdom. Look at what comes as his kingdom. This is such an important verse for us here in Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness. That is that we are pleasing to God through that righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not physical. See, we think that we need food and we think that we need water. And we do to keep our physical bodies together and alive. But that's not what we need to receive the kingdom of God. That's not what we need to receive the gifts that Jesus has for us, that the king brought with him. It's beyond the physical Which means that that I don't have to have anything in my life to accept this. I don't need a certain data plan. I don't need a, a certain amount of money. I don't need to live in a certain place. I don't need anything. And also, I can have an abundance of things. But that's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not food and drink. It's not what we see in the physical. It's something that touches your heart and your spirit. See, the kingdom of God came when the king came because Jesus loves you. And Jesus wanted you to have righteousness. He wanted you to have peace. He wanted you to have abundant joy. And it all comes through the Holy Spirit. And now I want to take a second. And of these three things, these three gifts, you know, up to this point we've kind of been going with this theme here. We've seen the gifts around the tree. We've opened the card. We know who it's from. We've kind of opened up, torn off the wrapping paper, and now we we know that it's righteousness, it's peace, and it's joy. But now it's like it's the fun part. It's the part where we get to open it up completely, and we get to play with it. We get to use it in our lives. So the first gift that we open, and I think of the three, this is the most important. It's the most transformational is that we get to open the gift of righteousness this morning see what righteousness is and especially as it pertains to us and Jesus is we are being made in right standing with God and what that means is before this happens we were not in right standing with God it means that there was God this perfect God and then there was us now when we are born in this world we're born separated from God Because we have sin in our lives. You know, no one has to teach their child how to lie or how to hit or how to do any of those bad things. It's amazing to watch Benjamin, our four-year-old, begin to learn how to manipulate or try and manipulate Casey and I. You know, he'll ask for something on the way home. Casey will tell him no, and he'll come in and he'll say, Hey, Daddy, um, can I... uh, jump on the trampoline, even though it's like 7.30 at night and he's supposed to go to bed. But he says it in a way that makes me think, did Casey tell him he could jump on a trampoline at 7.30 at night? I don't want to go against what my wife has said. And so then I'm like, "Uh, I don't know, man. Let me talk to mom. Meanwhile, mom's like, oh, we need to talk to dad. Benjamin plays the two of us together. He doesn't have to be taught that. That's just in our nature. We have a sinful nature. But because of what Jesus did on Christmas morning... Because of that gift that he gave us, we are made righteous. We have the opportunity to accept that gift. And we accept him as a gift, that baby that has a spiritual and miraculous impact on our life, then we are made in right standing with God. And because we are made in right standing with God, that opens up the door to so many other gifts. But look at what happens when we're made in right standing with God. Something really special happens and this is this is like you know this this is almost like magic here you know as a child I used to think what superpower would I have if I could have a superpower you know it was um, flying or it was you know teleporting 
now I, I think the superpower I would want to have is uh, to be made invisible. That way I could just stand still and pretend I'm not there, right? You know? Not so that I could be in places I don't need to be, but just so I could hide from people. That would be fantastic. But see, because of being made right with God and being made in right standing with God, if we look at 2 Corinthians 5.21, look at how the, the superpower of invisibility kind of plays out in our life. For our sake, for us, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. This is Jesus. Jesus, who knew no sin, came to earth. And he came as a baby. The king comes so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what that means is that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Is that we are hidden in Christ. We are invisible because when God looks at us, God doesn't see us. He doesn't see my sin. He doesn't see all the the wrong or bad things that I've done. Instead, what God sees is Jesus. I'm invisible in Christ. All my sin is invisible. And that, that's an amazing thing. To be looked at by the Savior and for God to only see the glory that God has sent His Son to die for, just being bestowed on me, that grace that I just get to accept. That that's what God sees when He looks at Chris Ladd. When He looks at you, that's all that He would see. That's amazing. See, righteousness as a gift... Righteousness is a gift that you cannot earn. You can't earn this. Jesus did his part so that you could have this. But it is a position, because we're made in right standing with God, that grants you the peace and the joy that comes in those other gifts. Because we have right standing with God, we get to open the rest of those gifts. See, when you are made right with God, you get all the stuff that comes with Jesus. You don't get some of it. You get all of it. And we need to start claiming all of it. Because some of us think that we get some of it. But some of it doesn't come with us and it doesn't apply. But it all comes. Because we've been made right in the sight of God. And so if we open our second gift, when we open the gift of peace here. Peace is something that, that, that it, it's another emotion that we should just be able to walk in. We should lay our head down at night and we should feel peaceful. Now, I know that some of us, all of us at times, we don't feel that peace. I'm not up here pretending that because this is in the Bible and I preach it and I say it, everyone just feels it. Like, let's be real. We, we, we have large swaths of time in our life where we do not feel peace. But if we've given our life to Christ, if we've been made righteous in Him, then what potential are we missing out on? What is God trying to do in us? Because He promises that He gives us peace, but we don't feel that peace. Why is that? You know, that it almost has to not make sense. And here's why it has to not make sense. And God's peace is described to us here in Philippians 4.7. It says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, that means it doesn't make sense, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If peace made sense, then we would be able to uh, logically find our way to it all the time. That means that we wouldn't need God to obtain it. But we do need God, and that's why it doesn't make sense. It surpasses all understanding because in our situations where we should not be able to feel and find peace, there is peace there for us. I think sometimes we don't accept that peace because we're trying to understand why we don't feel it. We're trying to understand why we don't have it, or we're trying to understand how we get it, or, or we put qualifiers to it. I will feel peace when... Such and such happens. I will feel peace when I get to this point or that point. We qualify it. But that's not the way this promised peace works. We don't have to understand it. We don't have to deserve it. We don't have to earn it. It's ours and it surpasses all understanding. So let's stop trying to understand this gift of peace. And instead, let's just start asking God to just pour it out on us. And then let's ask God to open up our hearts and our minds, our eyes, and even like 
actually ask God to make you, make you dumb. You know, you can do that. God, just, I'm, I'm too much of a thinker. I'm too smart for my own good. Just make me dumb. Just so that I can just blindly and dumbly, like a child, accept this peace. And it doesn't have to make any sense. But I'm just going to expect it and reach out for it and ask you for it. I, I pray for all of us that in our moments of least understanding that we can accept this peace. We can find this peace. And so the way that these gifts that God has given us work, it, it works kind of like a, a, a chain of events here. So f- first, if we seek Jesus, then we receive righteousness. We're made in right standing with God. And because we're made righteous, we're then given this peace, this peace that surpasses all understanding. And because we're given this peace and we are at peace, then we experience great joy. See, nowhere in here are our circumstances mentioned. Nowhere in here does it talk about how your problems will go away and your problems will change. This has nothing to do with whether or not your car starts or breaks down or whether or not you have the money that you, that you wish you had or that you don't have. It, it, this has nothing to do with your circumstances at all. This has everything to do with what actually matters, your heart, your soul. See, the baby of Jesus came, the king came, and he brought great gifts with him, the best gifts possible. And those gifts are righteousness, which comes because we receive Jesus. It's peace because we've been made righteous. We have a peace that surpasses all understanding. And then at that peace, we get to experience joy. The last gift for us to open is the gift of joy. You know, joy is, is a happiness. It, it's a, it's a, a strong emotion. It, it's a strong state of the heart. Can you remember the last time that you were just abundantly filled with joy? It, it, it was probably that 13th check that came in this week, right? But even more than that, you know, think about the last time that something happened. You were abundantly filled with joy. I think about the two times that, that I greatly participated in our childbirthing process. As my wife shakes her head no. And that baby comes out. Actually, I'll tell you when I experienced joy in that process. This happened for both of our children. Baby pops out, you know, deed is done. They get cleaned up. They, they get pushed away into a bed somewhere. And both times uh, I went, I actually went to the gym, worked out after that happened. Casey was like, go on, get out of here. And both times I picked up, for, she wanted Kawhi, and we, we got like a, a, a steak wrap. And then both times I came back and we had that, that visiting hour that, or that time together. And both times I walked in, and I saw my wife sitting on the bed, glowing, radiating, with, with that baby in front of her, sleeping, swaddled up like Jesus in a manger. And, and in those moments, those two moments, I experienced great joy. I, I experienced great joy when I got to pick up our son uh, from the journey a couple weeks ago. It's a thing that Rhonda Bosch boys do where they hike for 10 days. And on, on the journey... Uh, I, the, the kids were given these letters. They spent 36 hours alone, solo. And, and for, some of, for some of the kids and for some of you, that would be miserable, you know. But Mr. Invisible here, I would love that, you know. But Leaf was very extroverted, and so we wondered how he would do. But on that journey and in that time, in that 36 hours, they would give letters that the parents had to write. And the kids would read their letters in that time period. And one of the things I told Leafa in, in my letter is that I didn't hug him enough. I was going to hug him every day from there on out. And when I picked him up at the end of his journey, the first thing I did, I gave him a big hug. Joy. Abundant joy. You know what's amazing when I think about the moments in my life where I felt joy? Is they all have to do with a father-son relationship. And because of the relationship that I have with my Father, my Heavenly Father, I, I get that joy from Him as well. That's why we worship. That's why we sing to Him. And in Psalm, there's a beautiful verse here on joy. Psalm 68.3 But let the godly rejoice. 
exchange where I find my heavenly father hugging me, loving me. You know, he writes me letters every day. My father all have letters, love letters. You all have promised letters where your heavenly father says, I'm going to hug you every day for the rest of your life. Or he says, I'm going to love you abundantly for the rest of your life. Leave me and I'm never going to leave you. We all have those love letters and we can read it every single morning. And that love letter is God's word. It's right here. Part of that gift that we got. And so I I hope that this has been uh, thought provoking for you. See, the, the king has come. And the king always arrives with gifts. Righteousness, peace, and joy. But even better than this, as a child of the king, we always receive the best. And that's the gift that I hope you receive uh, over Christmas Eve and over Christmas Day, those services, and even into New Year's. These are the gifts that I hope mark your 2024. Whatever's happened in 2020, in exhaustion, we can finish the year righteous, filled with peace, and filled with great joy because the child of the king always receives the best gifts.